You'll have to excuse me. I'm sitting here playing with the, the little camera that we use for the YouTube videos that we sometimes make when we're actually putting a, a show together. And some of those are posted, of course, at our KLIX. Well, it's News Radio 1310 KLIX Facebook or Facebook page sometimes, but it's actually the YouTube page. Sometimes I just send that over to Facebook. Got it? And sometimes I send it to LinkedIn. Oh, and sometimes to Twitter. They, they have us involved with so many different what you call social media platforms. I never thought I would even do Pinterest, but I'm uh, I'm doing Pinterest now, which seems mainly, well, women go there and they put pictures of their favorite recipes up. I I do other things, uh, chicken recipes. I'm sorry, I just I don't know that many. You take a little chicken, you throw it in a crock pot, dump a quarter beer in with it, and let it simmer for about three hours. Very very good. Throw a little Old Bay on it afterwards, and you're all set. Lots taking place today that we'll be talking about. Steve Millington joining us in about 20 minutes. Right here on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. We'll talk a little bit about this primary taking place today in New Hampshire, which could be the winnowing process really kicking up. But uh, last week we had some Republicans who dropped out of the race following Iowa when they realized, you know what? We don't have any money left. It's not really where you finish. It comes down to how much it, well, Jim Gilmore, you may recognize that name if you uh if you were living in Virginia, let's say uh, you know, a dozen years ago when he was governor there. Uh, the man loaned himself $32,000 to continue his campaign, which, again, I, I think that consists of getting into an old uh, hatchback and driving up to New Hampshire, stopping at a diner, and then going back home to Richmond or wherever he calls home. Eight minutes after 8 o'clock, Bill Colley with you on Top Story on News Radio 1310, KLIX, and News Radio 1310.com. I wanted to open the program, though, today talking a little bit about what you're paying for gas. We, we briefly delved into this yesterday when I mentioned that gas on Saturday had dropped at the Walmart in Twin down to a buck 66.9. I saw that Saturday morning. And then there's a spot on the south end of town where gasoline is a buck 99.9. And I had mentioned there's a 33 cent swing in prices. Now, somebody had said that gasoline at Walmart, that's Chinese gasoline. And somebody chimed in yesterday on the program saying, well, it very well could be. I don't know about you, but if you're someone looking to save money, is that going to stop you? Let's be honest about that. <laughs> money is something that's not always in plentiful supply. Today, driving by that very same set of gas pumps, $1.63.9. So we're starting to finally see prices at the pump adjust to what's going on with oil prices around the world. There was a brief, I mean, it, I won't even call it a spike, but oil climbed back up. But I just looked at my computer at my, my, my desk in the office before I walked into the studio. And there's a story just in the last hour out of BBC, that's British Broadcasting. And the writer says, do not expect that to last long because we're going to see a lot more oil being pumped. And that means we're going to see prices dropping. And as a friend of mine said over the weekend, he told me, he said, within two weeks, most places in the country will be under a buck fifty a gallon. Now, there's this is a double-edged sword, as many of you know. It's great. It's like having a tax cut when when you're no longer paying two fifty a gallon for gas, and if it drops down to a buck fifty or a buck, you're going to if you do a lot of driving, especially with your job, you're going to have a lot more money left over, which then you can spend in other places. You might buy clothing. Americans spend money on services generally, not necessarily on manufactured goods any longer. But even those services can keep someone else working for a while. Now, that's the, that's the positive in all of this. The negative in all of this is whether or not it's oil causing the economic downturn or the economic downturn around the world causing the drop in oil, the more and more the price of oil drops, you start to have deflation in a lot of different places, and that's not good. There's got to be an equilibrium somewhere in there where that price per gallon of gasoline balances and you can keep the economies of the world going. But if it goes too low, then the economies of the world are going to, the, the, the sign, and again, I don't know the causality here, but we could have some serious, serious issues. Really low price gasoline. When my dad told me about gasoline in the depression being priced at eight gallons for a dollar, that was not a sign of economic health. It's 811 now, 29, on our way into the mid to upper 30s today, Really some nice weather coming along. Temperatures in the 50-degree range later this week, through the weekend, and even into next week. So we may have turned the corner on winter. This is from a fellow by the name of Benoit Faucon. 
That's a French name. He's writing at Wall Street Journal. International Energy Agency warns oil prices could fall further as oversupply worsens. He says uh, petroleum got worse in January with a surge in production from OPEC, a top global energy monitor, said Tuesday. Crude prices have fallen more than 55% in just about 18 months. A little, little under 18 months. And now you've got Iranians who are putting oil on the market because some sanctions have been lifted, the deal that was made with Iran a couple of months ago, for better or for worse. And as I understand it, and, and, you know, and I'm hearing a little bit of this dribbling in from people in various parts of the world and from friends who are, who are speaking with me, 2015, actually, the numbers, they're not looking back on it, and they're not saying that more oil was produced than they thought was produced last year, which is also depressing the price. And then it mentions Iran uh, boosted its, uh, its, uh, its exports by about 3 billion barrels per day when the sanctions were lifted. That's a lot of oil. Uh, was it a billion? Let me double check that. Let me just flip back here a page or two, and I'll be able to give you two, well, million, excuse me, if it was billions. We definitely would be having gasoline at about 10 cents a gallon. <clears throat> well, again, for the short term, that would be really, really nice. Iraq even set a new production output, 4.3 million barrels a day, thanks to increased production of 50,000 barrels a day. We were told that the Iraqi oil industry was dead. Apparently that's not true. And then it mentions that things are going to, uh, things are going to get even worse because of the risks to some of the emerging economies that are coming along. So I thought I'd pass that along this morning as well as this. Uh, this is from uh, the Wall Street Journal as well. Uh, this is from an editorial today. Chesapeake at bay. It's getting uglier by the day in the oil and gas patch, as investors in Chesapeake Energy can attest. And then the writer goes on to talk a little bit about what's happening in places like North Dakota and Texas, where most of the fracking for oil is now taking place in this country. And we mentioned this yesterday. I believe at 12.7 billion barrels last year, the USA is now the world's largest producer of oil. Largest producer of oil. A title I think we haven't had since about 1970. And it says the larger sell-off may be overwrought unless we're heading into a recession, but that's not true in energy markets, which are already in recession and for which the carnage is going to get much worse, as long as oil prices stay near $30 a barrel. One website I looked at this morning said $20 a barrel will come shortly. And uh, that'll be the lowest prices we've seen since the Asian meltdown 18 years ago, when gasoline in most parts of the country was below a dollar a gallon. And I can remember an economist telling one of the reporters who worked for me at the time that gas in real dollar terms in 1998, spring of 1998, was at its lowest since 1917. In other words, it was the cheapest in history. And we may be on our way once more. And then finally this. You may have heard, I was away for a few days last week because I was involved in a move from one house to another. You may have heard, though, that the President of the United States is proposing in his budget a $10 tax on each barrel of oil that would be, I guess, produced in this country. He couldn't really tax those people who are producing it elsewhere. That's where it gets a little, little suspicious. There is a writer, however, coming out of Reuters in England, and his name is John Kemp. No relation to the former football quarterback. Uh, that was Jack, Jack being short for John, obviously. But it goes on to say the most important thing to remember about the clean transportation plan is that it stands no chance whatever of becoming law. So no, the president will not be reaching into your pocket and taking more of your money. The writer says the president can propose, but Congress basically makes the decision on all of this when it comes to budgeting. And he says while the president is required by law to submit a unified budget, Congress is under no obligation. The budget is therefore something of an ironic work of fiction, the writer goes on to say. But listen to this. I started passing through this uh, story. It's about five or six pages long. Can't read it all for you. But he says the special tax breaks available to oil and gas producers have been the subject of controversy since before World War II. He says the Obama White House published in uh, February 2009 a plan to eliminate all the remaining tax breaks. And they thought that would raise an extra $31 billion, which would be spent very, very quickly considering the way the government spends money. And in the, uh, the, the seven years that have passed since then, nobody has paid any attention to that initial proposal in Congress. So he's not getting anywhere with all of this. This is all just to make a big show for all of his green energy friends. So they'll say, hey, he was a wonderful guy when it came to the giant pinwheels out on the prairies and out in the, uh, the high desert. And uh, he, certainly, he certainly was a good friend of solar energy, uh, because he wanted to have a $10 tax per barrel, an additional tax. 
And the writer says the president's proposal is in many ways an updated version of a very old idea to increase federal taxes on gasoline and diesel. But here's the thing. And this shows you just how much government never reduces its size. And the, the numbers, the figures that I pass along to you in gasoline taxes will, will really underscore this. It's a little bit like buying stamps. You know, when I was a little boy, you could get a stamp for about two cents. And then it went to six and then quickly to eight, ten. 12, and the next thing you know, and now what? We're paying about 50 cents. Well, I don't mail many letters. Last time I did, it was about 50 cents. The federal government, the writer says, began collecting taxes on gasoline sales at the rate of one cent per gallon in 1932. Herbert Hoover was still in the White House. That's not even a Franklin Roosevelt socialist tax. So way back in 1932, and then that increased to two cents in 1951. So nearly a full two decades passed. And they doubled the tax from a penny to two pennies. And you're thinking, well, okay. And then it jumped in just under eight years to four cents per gallon. So it doubled one more time, but much more quickly. And then there was a long stretch from 1959 until 1983 where everything seemed quiet. These were the Reagan years, just like the Hoover years. We're talking about a Republican president. Nine cents in 1983, so it more than doubled, but again after nearly a quarter century. Then it quickly leapfrogged just seven years later to 14 cents in 1990. Then in 1993, that federal tax jumped to 18.4 cents a gallon. Now it hasn't moved since. So we're nearly at the longest stretch since we've been collecting gasoline taxes in this country, the other being 24 years up until 1983. We are now at 23 years. But here's here's my point. When you have a a penny and then two pennies or four cents a gallon, all right, I can see that you've got some programs you might be thinking about you'll pay for. Bridge repairs, maintenance on the interstate highway system, all of those things. And the more that people drive, the more money you bring in with this tax revenue. Think about that. Even in Idaho, with our new tax on gasoline that went into effect last September, gasoline prices drop. If we drop to a dollar a gallon, people are going to drive more, and the projected $92 million they hope to raise will likely end up raising about $200 million and take care of all of those road repairs. So there's a, there's a positive from the actual drop in prices. You'll drive more, but you'll pay more in the taxes, which will then help the state out in the long run. But when you jump to 18.4 cents a gallon in a, in a span of, well, 70 years, from a penny in the beginning, it just shows you government doesn't get smaller. Government just continually needs more money, but it's not just a doubling. Eventually, it's exponential growth. And, and you just keep seeing these prices, they go up each time by a larger share. The American people at some point have to say enough. You know, let, I know better how to spend my money, ultimately. 20 minutes after 8 o'clock, Bill Colley with you on Top Story this morning on News Radio 1310, KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. Steve Millington will be along this morning. Also, hey, want to point out Governor Otter is going to be with us tomorrow morning right here on KLIX. We'll, we'll get to our uh, studio guest in just a moment, uh, but I do want to mention uh, tomorrow morning, 8.30, Dr. Jonathan Tripp will be joining us in studio or one of his associates from Tripp Family Medicine right here in Twin Falls, Idaho, located on Fillmore Street across the street from the main post office. And we do this on a weekly basis with the doctor's office and have a lengthy conversation about a medical issue and we take some telephone calls. But you can call really about any any medical issue you have because this is a real opportunity to talk to somebody in studio, friendly voice, and it won't cost you anything to give you some medical advice or point you in the direction of someone who can actually uh, deal with a medical issue that you may be uh, you may be concerned about. So that'll take place tomorrow morning between 8.30 and 9 o'clock. And remember, life's too short not to feel good. But also, I want to point out later in the week, on Friday, uh, the doctor is coming in as well, and we're going to have a lengthy conversation, and the focus is going to be entirely on this thing called the Zika virus and what you should know and if it's really just a media-generated panic, or if there are some serious concerns about what it could do. It's 825. Bill Colley, of course, with you this morning on Top Story on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. It's 29, and Steve Millington has wandered in from the farm this morning. Good you, morning. You were you were up early, too. Yeah, you know, it, it's uh, I, I enjoy getting up early. And, and, and just habitually, we get up early in the morning, and so it's kind of 
uh, uh, refreshing to have a specific assignment you have to take care of, and so that gets you fired up and gets you moving first thing in the morning. That's okay. I like it. I slept until 10 after 4 on Sunday morning, and I thought, wow, this is great. You're developing some bad habits here. <laughs> well, you, you know what happened is uh, a little after 4 o'clock, the, uh, the, the, the cat started yeah. coming over and, and doing everything in his power to wake me up, and that he's better than an alarm clock because the alarm clock doesn't reach out and paw you. Yes, yeah, that's true. Yeah. You can reach over and just kind of slap it and go back and take a little snooze. Yeah, we just right. were having a – before we get into some politics, uh, we were having an off-air conversation about – uh, the the fellow who mentioned to me the other day, uh, Christopher, who's a works for another radio station here in town, but good guy, uh, had said that Walmart is selling, and he may have been it may have been meant tongue in cheek that yeah. Walmart was selling Chinese gas. Well, they sell everything else from China. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, it could you, it's their loss leader. It brings you into the store, so you spend a hundred bucks on something else. That's right. That, that their intention is to get you in their quote parking lot, and and that's kind of a generic kind of a term. And and uh, then get into your wallet, and it, it works. We, we can go to, to Walmart, we can fill up the vehicle, we can go in the store and get everything we need, and then go home. Right. So And that gasoline, as you were telling me, likely comes from a couple of different sources, but most likely from just north of Salt Lake. Yeah, there's uh, two or three big refineries in the, just of north of Salt Lake, between uh, Salt Lake and Bountiful right there. If you're going down I-15, uh, you can see the refineries off on the, the west side of the freeway right there. Chevron has a big one. Phillips has a big one. Fly and J has a big one. There's another one. I can't remember the name. Sorry, you know, I get old. You forget what's going on. So that's probably where our quote refined product comes from, and and they put it in the pipelines in uh, in Salt Lake City, and uh, they have a dedicated pipeline that runs from Salt Lake to uh, uh, the we call it the Burley uh, Terminal, Burley Rack, and if you get between Burley and uh, Declo uh, along the the old Highway 30 out there. There's a big, quote, tank farm, and you can see all these big storage tanks out there. Well, that's the, where the pipeline comes in. Now, the pipeline splits uh, about where I-84 and 86 make the split, and one leg of the pipeline goes to Pocatello. And as you go into Pocatello across the road from Simplot's big plant, you'll see a, uh, a whole bunch of storage tanks, and that's where the Pocatello pipeline uh, terminates. It also uh, the, the continues a leg from Burley clear to Boise. And there's a tank farm in Boise. So for most of Idaho, not North Idaho, obviously, but for most of Idaho, we're looking at, at gasoline products coming out of the uh, Chevron pipeline. It doesn't belong to Chevron anymore. It's been spun off to a separate independent organization. In, in my previous life, it was just called the Chevron pipeline. So that pipeline comes this direction, and that's where we get most of our refined product from. Now, it doesn't mean that all of it comes out of one single refinery. They may have different, they, they use kind of an air block inside the pipe, and, and they'll ship Chevron product and put it in these three tanks, and they'll ship up uh, Fly and J product, or they'll ship up uh, Conoco product, Phillips product, and, and so it, it kind of scattered around. And, not, and even though they have their own service stations in many cases, a lot of the gasoline is sold to other people, such That's as... Right. Walmart and some of these other other players exactly and 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 they the, the the when the the fuel gets to the pipeline it may be withdrawn by a wholesaler for this account or that account and that there's a kind of a big accounting system behind the scenes that that moves the gasoline to this wholesaler and he pays for it and so it's it's kind of invisible to us but and then you know they have that special additives that we put in right. our fuel. Well, those really are in that fuel, and so they put it in a tank, uh, a special storage tank, and that's where you draw from. I knew that when I lived on the eastern shore of the uh, Chesapeake Bay, uh, I had a Shell gas station in the neighborhood, but I also noticed that the same delivery truck went down to the giant supermarket and actually delivered gasoline there a block away. So it was the same dang product. The, the, the wholesalers can go into the, to the, to the storage facilities, and they can order up product for ABC company or XYZ company. And the, the, the guy that's running the storage farm will give them whatever product they're servicing on that day. We've got more with Steve Billington coming up. We're going to talk a little bit about the New Hampshire primary today and what that means. We already have early results. Yes. From Dixville Notch. That's on the way on News Radio 1310 KLIX and NewsRadio1310.com.